Now, good afternoon, and it's wonderful to be here just as the sun is shining. I was driving across after listening to the news earlier on, a little wary of coming anywhere near the river, but as we were coming uh, along the river valley, it was good to see that everything was draining away quite well. Some parts have been well flooded today, and it's good that we've got this break in the weather for the preaching of the gospel. And there really is something more than the sunshine to brighten our day. It is a wonderful message that we have to proclaim this afternoon here in the town square in Balamani. I want to read words from the Bible in 1 Corinthians in chapter 15. For what we want to consider is the, the message of the gospel. What is the gospel? And this is what the Bible says. These are words that were written by the Apostle Paul, that most effective communicator of the gospel message, a man who took it to the city squares and a man who ultimately took it to Caesar's palace. He reached right across the whole of the Roman Empire. And so far as we can tell, he got right across the Mediterranean before he died as far as to Spain. So he took this message. He preached it, but what was it that he preached? I read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen. And then the passage goes on to give to us the record of the eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Paul himself being one of them. So what then is the message of the gospel? And the first thing that we've got to say about it is that it is news to this world. This is something that was carried 2,000 years ago as a message never heard before in this planet. And it is still today, 20 centuries later, a message that is news to many people because they have not yet heard concerning Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Now, I am very much aware that many people today will be hearing this message and say, it's not news to me. And yet, I want to speak to you as if you've never heard the gospel before. Because if you're not seeing it, the gospel has had no effect upon your life other than perhaps hardening your heart to the goodness and grace of God. The message of the gospel is like the sun that can either soften or harden the heart. It is designed to soften the heart that we may come to know a God who loves us and a Christ who died for us to save us from the penalty of our sins so that we will not be in hell, but that we will in assurance be in heaven. But if we resist that message, we do so by hardening our hearts. The only sane and sensible thing to do is to stop struggling against God, to stop sinning against Him, to turn to Him and to turn to Jesus Christ for salvation. But if we refuse, we have got to stiffen ourselves, stiffen our resolve against God. And the more you do that, the harder you get. And the harder you get, the easier it gets to turn away from God. And I may be speaking to someone today, and you know the gospel. You know it well. Your heart is hard. I pray by God's grace you will yield today. Listen as if you have never heard it before. And respond to the goodness and grace of God through Jesus Christ. Listen to the gospel. The news that God has for this world. And find salvation through faith in his son. As we think of the news that came to our world 2,000 years ago. It began with joy. There's something about the gospel that Christians love to sing about. And there's a reason why we sing about it. There's a reason why songs are made. Because of joy. 
gladness. And it was at the birth of that little boy that the angels came down and they spoke about great joy to all people. Many have had the experience by the goodness of God to become parents. I was thinking quite recently that my own dad's experience of that was rather different to my generation. He used to point out the building there at British End Cologne in Antrim. And he says, son, whenever you were coming into the world, I was hanging off that, the edge of that building on a little bosun's nest, as they called it. He was halfway down the cladding, replacing the cladding, hanging with a steel rope attached to the top of the building. He says, that's where I was when you entered the world. Men didn't really go to delivery suites back then. They usually were cheesed. But all that changed, of course. In our generation, <coughs> and you might have got cheesed if you didn't go. You had to be there. And so I remember it well. Whenever God granted us the four little children that uh, came into the world. But when I became a grandfather, and that's another experience. I'm looking at some seasoned grandparents here, and you know full well what this is. You know what's about to happen. You're not quite sure when. Everything goes quiet. You're wondering, has it happened yet? Or, or maybe there are problems. And you get a little bit concerned. Well, I, we've only had one, so I, maybe, maybe whenever you reach the stage from some of you, whenever you count the number of grandchildren, you'll get used to it. Waiting for that call. Hoping everything's okay. Praying to God that the little one will come into the world safely and that mom will be safe as well. And then the call comes. Little girl, little boy, what joy. Oh, the joy of a new birth. There's nothing quite like it. It just lifts us up. Doesn't matter if you've got arthritis. Doesn't matter if you've got, you've got pains in your joints or, or, or all through your body. There's just something that touches you. Whenever a little baby is born, what joy in your little life. But this is no mere child. This is no regular boy. This is the Son of God made flesh. God incarnate. I don't know if you know that word. I love that word. God incarnate. It simply means God made as one of us. God made flesh. God becoming a little baby boy. Entering the world through a virgin's womb. Oh, what joy to the world the Lord has come. I tell you, this is a message of joy. It is news to the world of joy. Heaven has come down. I think if you stopped anyone. I was speaking yesterday to those of a completely different world religion and they spoke about people being with the angels and so it's the same across the world wherever you are people have this aspiration at the end of life whatever way it may work out that we will rise from this world and be in heaven oh my friend i say to you heaven first came down to earth so that earthlings like us might be in heaven God has entered our planet. Oh, the joy of the birth of Jesus Christ. But it's not only joyful news, but this is good news. I think not only of the joy of his birth, I think of the goodness of his life. For here is one who did good. He did good. Now some people, of course, it's true. I'm looking at people and... We would say about you, and I can use our own language here, she's a good soul, you know. But he's a powerful good one. And that's what you say about people. And they do good. They're, they're nice people, but there's none of us who do good all of the time. We can't do that. He did. He did nothing but good. For he is good. The only sinless human life. And the Bible says he went about doing good, healing all that are oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. And when he met the blind man, he made him see. When he met a dead man, he raised him to life. 
Whenever he met a leper that no one would come within 40 foot of, he came and touched him with his hand and cleansed him. He did good. He would do you good today. He would save your soul. He would forgive your sins. He did good in his life. And then the lovely little hymn says, that was inspired up there near Derry City, looking across from the walls. That little hymn says, There was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. Let me tell you of the goodness of Jesus Christ. The only one good enough to pay the price of sin. The joyful news of his birth. The good news of his life. But oh the powerful news of his death. Paul, one day he was writing to Christians in the city of Rome. He was telling them that he had on his long term planner a, a little note. Go to Rome. Visit the Christians in Rome. He wanted to go to Rome. I don't think he wanted to see the... The forum or the majestic buildings, I'm quite sure it's something bigger than mine. But as, as Paul thought about going to Rome, he says, I'm not ashamed. I've got something to tell the people in Rome. You see, Rome knew about Pompeii and the, the, the victory and the, the glory of that Roman general and how they would come and they would stir up the city before they entered and then in through the city would come all of those troops that had been victorious in battle many nations stood against rome not one succeeded in the end rome destroyed all of her enemies and pompey and julius caesar and many another like titus and the Stavian, they entered through the city with great ceremony and evidence of power. Paul, what have you got that can compare with that? The power of the Roman Empire. The power of the Roman swords. The two-edged sword that was the terror of the world that was known back then. He says, I tell you, I have something far more powerful. He says, I've got a message, and it is the power of God unto salvation. Here's a message that can turn hell to heaven. That can rid a person of their sins. That can utterly change a person from being completely dominated and enslaved by sinful habits. To set them free from their sin and set them on the course to heaven. I tell you, he says... I've got a message and I'm not ashamed of it. It's the power of God to salvation. What's, what's the power in this message? It's in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, not only in his birth there is joy. And in his life there is goodness. But in his death there is power. I don't know if you've ever done this. I think it's still free, the Imperial War Museum over in London. And whenever you've got kids, you love free museums. It's always expensive to take them around, but especially whenever you get a few extra uh, coming, tagging along. So you like to go into those museums that are free. And so you can go in and you can look at some of these World War II bombs. Now, wh whenever the war was going on, they were a terror. Can you imagine seeing one of those being dropped from the sky? Not having time to run in any direction to get away from its blast. And then why, why are all these children poking and prodding at it? It's the same bomb. Ah, but it has been disarmed. It's there on display to remind people of the seriousness of hatred that stirs up war still there but it's been disarmed it'll not do you any harm i tell you this death was disarmed by jesus christ when the lord jesus died on the cross death died too because he rose again he embraced death to disarm death and to rise as a victorious savior and so that we could trust in him and no longer have the fear of death you know for every christian death 
has been disarmed. I've been in a room where the number of believers have left us and gone home to heaven. And I cannot explain to you the peace of their passing. Death is horrible. And it's still left in our world to remind us of the seriousness of sin. But for the Christian that has been disarmed, it no longer harms us forever. It's simply the door that opens to the other world, into the presence of Jesus Christ and the glory of heaven. Oh, I tell you today, this, this is a message well worth listening to. And if I could, by the power of God, just communicate to you something of this message, would you respond to his joy, the birth of the Son of God entering our world, heaven coming down that we might be in heaven, to the goodness of his life, no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in the power of his death and resurrection. And that's really what's here in this passage. Well, there are two things, really, that I want to bring before you. And number one is the facts. And number two, it's your faith or your lack of it. You see, the gospel works this way. First of all, we present the facts. And then, number two, it's up to you, it's up to me, as to whether we have the faith. Whenever Paul is reflecting upon the fact that these people, they were in their sins, they were living lives that were uh, even an embarrassment in our age. And that's saying something. He says, I preached the gospel to you. And you believed it. And you were saved. So let's think just for a moment, I'm not going to be long, just for a moment about the facts of the gospel. And there are two. Two great undeniable facts. In the gospel. Number one is this. That Christ died for our sins. You see Paul wants, he wants to do something with this. He wants, he wants us to see how undeniable these facts are. You can choose to ignore them but you cannot deny them. Christ died for our sins. And so far as we can tell on the 3rd of April, A.D. 33, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, outside the city of Jerusalem, He died at around about 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And Pilate was shocked. And he sent a soldier back to make sure it was the case. He's already dead. Christ died. See, Paul says, let's start here. He says the Bible had already said it would take place. For hundreds and hundreds of years, God had spoken to the world through a nation, the nation of Israel. And he told the world that the Son of God would come, that a Savior would suffer and bleed and die on the cross. That he would be between transgressors. That he would be sold for 30 silver coins. That his hands and feet would be pierced. That they would take his garments and they would divide them among them. And then for the one remaining garment, gamble for it. That they would stand and mock him. Many of you know these scriptures that I'm referring to. Some of them stretch back 1500 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. Others, like Isaiah 53, that tell us why he died. They stretch back seven centuries before the birth of Christ, but he was wounded. Oh, listen to it in the language, in the, in the, the full force of the, the Hebrew language. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed. He was bruised for our iniquity. The punishment, the capital punishment that ought to have been ours was on him so that we might have peace. And with his stripes, oh can you not see the cross on all of us, the scourging of his body, the beating, 
The cross itself, that instrument of capital punishment. And the piercing of hands and feet. And yet, Isaiah says, looking through it all, he says, it was for you. It was for me. It was for our sins. Paul's saying this. How can you, how can you deny this? And the Bible said it was going to happen. And it did. According to the scriptures. But there's more than that. People saw it happen. Whenever they start preaching the, the gospel in those days, they said, look, <laughs> these things were not done in the corner. It was done at a time whenever Jerusalem was bursting at the seams. People from every part of the world were there. Perhaps a million people or even more crammed into that little city, had traveled there for a notable feast. And now the word goes out. To the whole world so that political leaders they hear about it people around the world they know about it the world then knew and they could lay hold on someone in every one of these parts of the roman empire that had been there tell us what happened oh the, the sun grew dark in the middle of the day they would tell you we trembled we did not know what was taking place and then, around about three in the afternoon, there was a tremble, and the earth shook. This man died, and the whole of heaven and earth was moved at his death. I tell you this, this was something that the world knew about. It was earth-shattering news. It went around the world that Christ had died. Aye, but there was more than that. They saw him buried, and witnesses came. And they saw the tomb was sealed. He died for our sins. Isn't that amazing? He died. Can you stop and think? The Lord of life, the, man, the one who created you, the God who created you, died for you on the cross. Would that not make you stop and think today? Just hold on a minute. Whatever else I'm doing, God died for me. The Son of God gave himself for me. Oh, he must love me. If he would do that. The indisputable fact that Christ died for our sin. And then he rose again. The third day, I've been to the tomb. And with many millions of others, I can tell you it's, it's empty. Oh, I tell you, there was a spring in my step that day. When out into the sunshine, I stepped from the darkness of the tomb. And I saw the words, he is not here. He's risen as he said. And I look back to the place where the Lord lay. I tell you, that is something worth preaching. If nothing would get you preaching, that would. There's one who has defeated death, risen victorious. And I could go on and tell you the same thing the Bible told it was going to happen, told when it was going to happen, told how it was going to happen, and then it did happen. And then there were people, and they saw that the Lord was raised. These are facts undeniable. But facts will not take you to heaven. Facts make it possible for you to be in heaven. But they will not take you there. You need to put your faith in Jesus Christ. And this is not a take it or leave it kind of thing. You see, sometimes people, people have surgery, but it's cosmetic surgery. I was speaking to a surgeon yesterday. He told me what kind of surgery he did. And I said, well, is it cosmetic? He said, no, no. No, the kind of surgery I do has to be done. It's necessary. And people think that religion is like a cosmetic surgery. You can have it or not have it. It might make your life look a little bit better. You might be a better person, a good living person, all of that. I tell you, that's, that's, not, that's not Christianity at all. This is a life-saving, soul-saving surgery in which the God of heaven removes your sin. In all its guilt, and fits you with a new life for him. That's what it is. This is something vital. But to get it, you must put your faith in Jesus Christ. So many boys and girls go to Sunday school, children's meeting. They love putting their hand up and getting the prize. For they know the facts. It's another thing to put your faith in a person. I'm concluding now, but let me tell you, 
my own experience, it'll maybe help you. I was suffering heart failure for over 10 months. And eventually the surgery is do or die. And I remember seeking out a surgeon by name, asking if I could go on his list. And eventually I got to the top of that list and the day came and I sat down and the surgery was for the next day. And all the risks and all were explained and then there was a piece of paper. I said, what's this? He says, you've got to sign there. I need your consent. Your life in my hands. Do you trust me? And I remember putting my pen to paper. I trust you with my life. I couldn't save myself. He had to do it for me. Are you prepared to trust your soul to Jesus Christ? As he puts across the agreement and asks you to sign, just notice this, that the hand that puts it across the table is already wounded. He's been to the cross for you. He died for you. He rose again. He says to you today, I can take care of your sin. I can save your soul. I can change your hell to heaven. Are you prepared to trust me? Because the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Oh, I say to you today, would you not listen to the gospel? The joyful news of the gospel. The birth of the Son of God. The good news of the gospel. There is no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. The powerful news of the gospel. That there is one who has disarmed death by dying for our sins and rising again. And if you trust him, he will save you. Can I say to you, if you refuse him, you will harden your heart. And you will be lost. The choice is yours. But we pray you in Christ's name, make the right choice. Trust Christ today. Our Father, we come to thee at another time in the